lectures used to spend the first two days going over administrative stuff, and I've been paring it down each time that I've taught this. I think I've got it down to about five minutes now. <laughs> so um, I will defer you to Canvas for most of this. So this should be what your, your Canvas page looks like. Um, the only thing I really want to talk about administrative-wise is this one-page bullet list of course notes. Um, you can read this on your own, but let me just hit a few highlights for you. Um, the book for this course is 10 chapters. We're going to mainly concentrate on the first five. We'll touch on the remaining chapters um, towards the end of the course, but most of what we're doing, everything we need for the labs, is really in those first five chapters. And chapter one, I'm going to leave you to go through on your own. Okay, you should go through that tonight or tomorrow and bring questions on Thursday's class. The homework for chapter one is due on next Tuesday. So if you have questions about what's in there, what the homework questions are, are talking about, you want to be able to ask those on Thursday. Okay. Um, so grade assignment, 15% for labs, 15% for homework, 20 quizzes, 20 midterm, 30 for the final. Um, and some of this stuff is repeated in the syllabus, and the syllabus says different things. Ignore the syllabus if it conflicts with this. This is, um, this takes precedence over it. Um, test and exams are closed book. For uh, exams, I'll let you have four double-sided pages of notes. For tests, you can have two double-sided pages. I also have a handout that I'm going to give you in a little bit that has most of the relevant information you need from uh, what's called the data sheet for the chip we're going to be working with. Um, but other than that, closed book and no laptops and stuff like that for tests and quizzes. Um, I'm going to be giving homework very similar to what we did in 250, so you'll have a homework assignment pretty much each week. You'll turn it in on paper at the due date and I'll pick one problem to grade. So I won't tell you which problem ahead of time, so you should do all the problems. Um, homework should be done individually. Um, the homework is, again, like 250, there's a solved problem and an unsolved problem. I strongly recommend not looking at the solution to the solved problem, right? A good strategy for this course is, as we're going through lectures and learning new material, make yourself some notes and then try to create a note sheet that you would take for an exam. Right, that summarizes the highlights, and then try to do the homework using that note sheet. Right? If you take the whole book, there's 300 pages in this data sheet, there's a few hundred pages in the textbook. If you put all of that on the table next to you, and each time you do a question, you flip through all of that, you're not really testing yourself on understanding concepts. You're testing yourself on, can I find this stuff in the material here? So make yourself a note sheet and try to use that for doing the questions. If that succeeds, then you've got your note sheet ready for the exams, right? And you won't have any surprises. Um, so labs, there's six labs. You get to work on them um, after lecture, roughly seven to nine each day. Um, you're going to work in groups of two, OK? Um, and if we have an odd number of people, I'll let one group either have three people or somebody can work alone. The reason for working in groups is because you want to get practice doing engineering in teams, right? You want to get practice with communication and problem solving in groups and things like that. But it's really important that each person comes away from the lab completely understanding all pieces of it. Okay? What you don't want to do is say, hey, I'll write the code, you build the circuit, right? Because when you get to the exam and you have to design a circuit, you're not going to have experience doing that. And your lab partner is not going to have experience writing the code. So everybody should write their own code. Everybody should design their own circuit, okay? so that you're confident that you can do both pieces of that. But when you sit down to actually do the lab in the collaboratorium and build your circuit and load your code into it, you may you know, compare your code and say, OK, let's use my code. right? 
or you know, my circuit diagram is cleaner, we'll go ahead and use that. Build your circuit, do that as a team, test it, and so on and so forth. But make sure you understand all the pieces of it. And if you have time, after you've loaded in one person's code and run it, load the other person's code in and see if that works. Right? Especially if it's fundamentally different looking from, from the other person's code. Um, so think about how you're going to do that, right? and that's really important. Your lab write-ups have to be your own. Okay? The only thing that can be duplicated across lab reports is the source code listing. Because you're probably going to have one source code. Circuit diagrams, you should draw yourself. I recommend drawing them by hand. Get some graph paper, a straight edge, a pencil, and draw them by hand. Don't copy and paste them from the lab write-up itself. Okay? And don't have one person draw it and give the copy to the other person. All of that has to be done by each person. Okay? There's a reason for that. It's not just busy work. If you don't actually go through the process of writing that circuit out, of figuring out where your connections go and stuff like that, it doesn't internalize as well. And again, when you get to an exam and you've got to create a circuit from scratch, if you haven't done that, you might blank, right? And you're going to miss details. So lab reports um, on your own. Um, no late work except for lab reports. You've got to do all the labs by the end of week seven in order to pass the course. So if you don't get your lab report in by the deadline, turn it in as soon as possible afterwards. It costs you 10 points a day, starting with that afternoon or that evening. Um, but I will take it late. All right, that's it for my administrative detail talk. Um, if you have any questions on this or anything else or anything during the course, just go ahead and, and ask. Um, how's the sign-in sheet doing? Did you get it? All right, cool. try to frame this course for you, tell you what it is that we're going to be doing in here. And it's easiest to do this by looking at two other courses that usually precede this course. One is CSE 121, the other is Engineering 250. So 121 is programming in C, 250 is digital logic. All right, so what kinds of things do we do in 121? Um, you write a program that takes a string and tells you if it's a palindrome. So you compare characters somehow on each end moving towards the middle, and if the characters are the same, you say it's a palindrome. Or maybe you wrote a program that takes an interest rate and an amount of a loan and gives you a payment schedule, so how many months it's going to take to pay off that by adding an interest to the loan each time. So let's just look at that one. Um, suppose you have some amount due, which is like $100,000, and you have some interest rate. did something like this, month equals zero, well, amount due is bigger than zero, and how many increment a month, amount due equals amount due plus So you write some kind of code, right, usually with a loop that counts months and adjusts the amount of money that's due based on the interest rate and how much you're, you're paying and
and then print month. Um, I'll do, and that's the end of your while loop. So we've flipped into pseudocode here instead of just strict C. But you write some kind of loop, right? Now, that's not easy the first few times you do it. But once you understand how to program in C, once you understand how to use the debugger, how to use the compiler, and so on and so forth, it's pretty straightforward to write code like this, right? That's what becoming a computer scientist is about. That's what taking all these courses leads you to. Now suppose you write this program and you deliver it to the customer and they're like, this is great, this is exactly what we wanted. One change we want on it though, what we'd like is that once the total payment that's due drops below $10,000, we want you to light up an LED. What are you going to put in your C program to make that happen? For that matter, where are you going to connect the LED to your laptop to make that happen, or to the CTEC server to make that happen? There's no easy answer to this. Because for all of this stuff that we're doing, detecting palindromes, doing calculations and so on, we're kind of stuck in a box, right? It's a box we don't even get to touch. It's sitting on a server over in one of the AA buildings. And we can feed numbers into it through the PuTTY, and we can look at output through PuTTY, but that's kind of it. It's sort of a little virtual world that's cut off from the rest of reality. And trying to do something like light an LED or say, when I push this button, I want it to decrease the interest rate. There's no easy way to do that. Okay, so that's the CS world. Over here in Engineering 250, we do things like make a traffic light controller. Fond memories, right? <laughs> so we, we arrange to give this priority. And if a car comes, the light gives permission for that lane to go if it has priority over the other lanes. And in the final version of this in lab six, we introduced a yellow light. And when you were switching from green to red, the yellow light would come on for two seconds. Right? So it looked like a regular traffic light. All right. Fairly complex circuit. Right? And I will say that if you get really proficient, if you get a lot of practice building digital circuits, it's not as difficult to build this, but it's still, I mean, just physically wiring a couple of protoboards with chips together and debugging it and so on, it's still fairly ambitious. But it's outside the box. It actually interacts with LEDs and switches. And you could take this and you could put some sensors in the roadway and you could put a light up on top of some wires and you could connect those to this circuit, and you'd have a traffic light controller, right? Something we can't do with our simple C program running on CTEC. All right, so you deliver this circuit to the customer, and they're like, this is great, this is exactly what we want. One change we'd like to make, it's really minor. Between three and five in the afternoon, we want West to have priority because that's when rush hour traffic comes the other way. It's a pretty minor change, right? What would you have to do to your circuit to implement that? Would it be pretty minor? <laughs> probably not, right? You'd probably rip all the wires off in frustration, <laughs> and then you start from scratch. Or maybe the customer says, you know what we want to do? We want to count how many cars come along each section of road. And each hour, whichever direction has the most cars, we want to give that lane priority. Great. Yeah, <laughs> that's lab six plus. Um, not really, really a fun prospect, right? Now, think about our 121 project. We're calculating monthly payments. You know, once you get to month 60, I want the interest rate to drop to 4%. How hard is that to do? It's pretty easy. It's done. So 
so I'm being kind of obvious here about making a distinction between software and hardware, right? Software is very, it's a very agile environment to be in. It's relatively easy to make changes, but it's stuck inside a box. Hardware, very difficult to make changes, but it has the advantage of actually being able to interact with the outside world. Okay? We call this stuff software because it's soft, it's malleable, it's morphable, it's changeable. We call this stuff hardware because it's rigid. Right? It's like a rock. You pick it up, you squeeze it, you turn it over, it's still a rock. Right? Software we can change. So if we want to have the ability to work with the outside world, switches, LEDs, motors, sensors, but we don't want to have to rip our hair out every time that we want to build a certain behavior or modify the way something acts, we'd really like to combine these two worldviews. Right? And that's what Engineering 270 is. It's a way to fuse the agility of a software environment with the ability to interact with the outside world that we get in something like a digital circuit. So that's what we're going to be doing. And it's not that hard to imagine how to make this happen because we've got you know, a nice environment here where we can write something like C code, we can have loops and if statements and so on and so forth. We just need some way in our code to say, hey, turn this LED on. Right? So how many people have played with an Arduino? All right, Arduino is, is a simplified version of what we're going to be playing with in here. But it's basically a system that implements the C language, but it includes some library calls like digital write. And if you connect an LED, so an Arduino is a physical device. And if you connect this LED to certain places on that physical device, and then you execute a call that says digital write high, this LED will turn on. But we're not working with Arduinos in here. We're going much more low level. But the idea is the same. We're going to have a way from our C program to be able to do things like turn on LEDs or read switches. The cool part is we're not going to run this on our laptop and then somehow connect LEDs to it. We're going to run it on a dedicated piece of hardware. This is your computer. Okay. This is not only the interface to the LEDs and the switches, this is the actual computer that will run your program for you. Okay, it's called a PIC processor. It's made by a company called Microchip. And the part number is PIC 18F1220. You'll have that memorized in a week, don't worry. <laughs> and it's a full-blown <coughs> microcontroller. It has memory, it has a CPU, it has an arithmetic unit, it has a logic unit, it has uh, components inside for retrieving instructions and executing them, and doing conditional and loops and things like that. And it has a whole bunch of stuff inside for inter interfacing with physical pieces of hardware, LEDs, switches, motors. And it's all self-contained in this little 18-pin chip. This costs like a buck or something, by the way. Right, totally amazing. Um, and Microchip, the company that makes this, they make at least hundreds of different kinds of these chips, all with slightly different capabilities. This is the one that we use in this course. But what we learn here will apply more or less directly to <coughs> other versions of PIC processors. And a lot of it will apply to other kinds of microcontrollers outside of the ones made by Microchip. So what we're learning here is on one specific device, but it's, it's going to be very generally applicable. The concepts will cut across. So let me pass this around. Take one of these. I'll keep one for myself. And So, 
um, with this device comes a data sheet. When we talk about things like AND gates or inverters, um, we talk about the data sheet that describes how to use this chip. Well, there's a data sheet to go with the PIC processor. But it's fairly big. So here's the data sheet. It's 310 pages long. It's got a table of contents, if that tells you anything. <laughs> and it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And all of this is good stuff, but what I've got here is an 18-page distillation of what seem to be the most useful pieces from the data sheet. And this is the additional thing I'll let you use on tests and exams. Okay, so, um, but you should be able to use this for most of what you're doing in this course. And we will go through this in various detail. But let me just give you an idea of what we're looking at. Right, this is what's inside this PIC chip. And it's the second page of your handout. And we don't need to worry about what exactly all of these things mean, but just kind of marvel at the general notion of this. There's a program memory, which is 4,000 bytes. Okay, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it actually is, because the programs you're going to be writing are going to be fairly small. Um, it's got a program memory. It's got data memory. It's got all these pins that we can access. We can hook our LEDs and switches and stuff to these pins, and they're connected to things inside the system. It has four timers. It has something called an A to D converter for reading in voltages and converting them into binary numbers. It has an electrically erasable programmable read-only memory. We can store things here. Um, like data, it has a way to do serial I.O. It's got all this stuff crammed inside this one little chip. And we're going to eventually learn about pretty much all of these systems. Okay, but first we're going to learn a lot of basics about how to use this chip and how to, um, how to write programs for it. All right, so at this point, I want to offer you two insights into this course. We're going to take a break by every hour, by the way. We'll take a break halfway through the lecture, and then you'll be in lab. Um, let me share two insights with you. And these are based partially on my own experience in learning things, but also um, in my experience teaching this course and similar courses. And these are things that, if you keep them in mind, I think will help you be more successful in this course. The first insight. One of the biggest challenges in this course, and this is actually a life challenge, um, one of the biggest challenges we're going to face is learning to see things as they really are, instead of as we think they are. And that sounds pretty easy, but it's a huge struggle. It's probably our biggest struggle as a species right now. It's the reason that we suffer. It's the reason we have wars. Learning to see things as they are instead of as we imagine them to be. And let me give you an example from this course. I mentioned there's four timers in here. Okay, what does a timer do? It counts off a certain period of time, and then it somehow lets you know that that time has passed. So on your kitchen timer, you set it to 20 minutes, and after 20 minutes, it goes ding. Um, there's timers inside that do basically the same thing. And when you want to use a timer on your phone or on your stove, what do you do? You put in how long you want to wait, and you say start, and you wait until the alarm goes ding. That's not how timers work on here. And if we start talking about timers, and you come at it with the conviction that I'm going to load in how long I want it to wait, I'm going to say start, and it'll tell me when it's done, you're not going to get it. Okay? 
everything that we do is not going to make sense, it's not going to fit into that model of reality, and you're just going to get more and more frustrated, and somewhere down the road, maybe two weeks later, after a lot of beating your head against the wall, you'll suddenly see the light and say, oh, that's how it works, right? But most of the struggle was getting through this preconception of how things work. Okay, this leads to the second insight on this course, and this is probably the most important thing for you to keep in mind in this course. Um, and I was going to use a cooking example, so. Um, so suppose you like to cook, okay? Um, and you like designing meals, you like playing around with spices and seasonings and stuff like that. But when you're cooking, right, at some point you still got to chop onions. And you still got to wash dishes and things like that, right? Unless you're lucky enough to have an assistant. If you have an assistant, you say, you know, dice this onion for me. And you do the clever part, you know, figure out how you're going to prepare the meal and so on and so forth. Okay, imagine that you have an assistant who is absolutely dedicated to doing exactly what you tell them to. They are completely tireless, they never make mistakes, and they're very fast. And so you can say, dice an onion. The downside to this assistant is they don't know how to dice an onion. <laughs> okay? You've got to tell them. Because the assistants that know how to dice an onion, they cost more money, right? <laughs> this assistant cost a buck. <laughs> so how do you dice an onion? Um, take knife, uh, cut down, move over, and repeat. And then you got to flip the onion and do the other direction and so on. But you got to explain to the assistant how to dice an onion. Well, the problem with this assistant is they cost a buck. <laughs> they don't know what you mean by take the knife in your hand. They don't know what you mean by cut down with the knife. So we've got to tell them, move arm till hand is above knife. Lower arm, close hand, lift arm, twist till the knife is at 90 degrees, move arm till over onion, lower arm, got the idea? They may not know how to move their arm. You may have to tell them that too. All right? This is our life for the next eight weeks. We have this assistant that will do exactly what we tell it to do, but it's got a very limited repertoire of what it can do. We need to give it these scripts to tell it this is what I mean when I say turn this LED on for two seconds. Right? So we have to keep breaking things down into smaller and smaller pieces. Right? This is how we write C. Right? This is our main program. This is a function, this is a function, this is a function, this is a function, and this is a description of how to do that first function. And some of these, like twist till 90 degrees, might be other functions. It might say twist it you know, a little bit and then measure the angle, and if it's smaller than 90, twist it some more, and so on. Okay? And we're constantly going to find ourselves doing that with this processor. We're going to say, okay, I want to take this little robot and I want to drive straight for two seconds and then turn left 90 degrees. That's pretty simple, right? This doesn't know anything about that. It knows put five volts on this pin, put zero volts on this pin. That's about it. So we've got to write programs. And that's all that this is. It's a program. This is the program for dicing an onion. This is the program for using a knife, and so on. The challenge is, right, we get to lab, and I hear people say, you know, on their phone, 
yeah, I've, I've just got to make this thing go straight and turn left. I should be done in about 20 minutes. I'll meet you at Burgerville, right? <laughs> and if you go into it with that mindset, you're constantly going to be frustrated by the fact that it doesn't know how to do this. It doesn't know how to multiply numbers. It doesn't know how to compare two numbers to each other, right? All these things have to be broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about what those small pieces are and getting some proficiency in using those, but your job's gonna continually be to take what you need this thing to do and break it into those small pieces, okay? And this falls under that same umbrella of seeing the world as it is, right? We want this chip to be able to say something like, go straight for two seconds and then reverse the motor, right? And it just doesn't understand that. We've gotta tell it how to do that. All right, questions so far? So the textbook is online, you can get to it from the syllabus. So the textbook is a free PDF download. The data sheet itself is a PDF right here. And then this talks about labs and homework assignments and so on. Chapter one, you're going to go through on your own, right? And bring questions on Thursday. Oh, the other thing I should mention, and this usually gets me in trouble, but I posted a tentative schedule. I'm going to try to stick pretty closely to this, but this will give you an idea of, of where we're heading. So I broke this into pairs of classes A and B for each of the eight weeks. So um, I'm going to try to stick fairly close to these uh, units from the text, um, and they're not sequential. Okay, I've, I've rearranged them based on the labs. Um, but also, I'll usually assign homeworks on Tuesdays, and on Thursdays we'll talk about questions on the homework. Which means if I assign homework on Tuesday, you want to look at the homework before the next class. Okay, because the next class is your chance to say, I don't understand how to do this question. Okay, um, starting with homework one, which is chapter one. Um, and I put um, labs on here and also quizzes. So we're going to have four quizzes starting with week two, and they'll usually be on Thursdays. So week two and three will be quizzes. Week four is the midterm. Week five and six will be quizzes. Seven, there's no quiz. And then week eight, Tuesday, will be the final exam, okay, rather than Thursday. And then Thursday, we can talk about the final and go over it and wrap up the course. So eyeball that at your leisure. about this chip. So for lab one, you don't really need to know how to program the chip because you're given a program and you need to basically practice loading it into the chip and we'll go through the details of that. But let me start talking a little bit about programming this device. Okay, and we'll get more into this on Thursday. So, C is a nice, convenient language for us to work in. It's high level, right? We can write things like this, take the amount, give me times the interest rate, and subtract the monthly payment, and so on. 
And our C compiler, GCC, understands how to work with this sort of thing. Okay? The language we're going to use for this PIC processor is much more rudimentary working with called assembly language. So normally you write your C program, you run it through a compiler, and it actually creates it's usually a .s file, I'll just say .asm. This is C source. This is assembly language. And this goes through an assembler program, and you get what's called a .o file, and this is object code, which is binary. This goes through a command called LD, and that gives you your executable. Let me just say a dot out, which is executable. And usually, when we say GCC, it does all of these things for us automatically. But in reality, we're going from a high-level language C into assembly language, into binary machine code, and into an executable. On a PIC processor, we don't have this. We pretty much go straight from assembly to an executable. And we're going to concentrate on these two things, leaving C behind. So we're mostly going to be writing in assembly language and then using software to convert that into this binary code that we call machine code. But we're also going to learn how to write this binary machine code directly by hand. That's important. Because if you don't understand this machine code, this binary one and zero representation, you're not going to be as effective at writing assembly language. Right? To really know how to work with this processor, you've got to understand its ones and zeros. That's the language it understands. And if you understand that language yourself, you know a lot about this processor. You know a lot about its capabilities. You understand why certain things are set up the way they are. So in labs, we'll mostly write assembly language. But on homeworks and tests, we'll also be doing machine code directly by hand. And it's a fun thing to be able to do. So we're done with C until like week six when I'll touch on this again. And by then you'll miss the good old days of being able to write in C. <laughs> All right, so what are we what are we doing if we don't have C? So if you look on this, I should have numbered these. Look on the fourth page of this handout, it's figure 20-1. This and the table on the following page are probably the two pages that you'll use the most. So this processor, it has a memory inside, a memory that stores instructions, okay? And the instructions are all binary, ones and zeros. So we write an assembly, we're going to convert it into ones and zeros, and that's what actually gets loaded into this, this chip. So there's a memory, and the system will go into that memory and pull out one set of ones and zeros and say, what does this instruction mean to me? What am I being asked to do? And it will take some action based on that pattern of ones and zeros. And then it will fetch another set of 16 bits from memory and say, what am I supposed to do in response to this? And it will take some action. And it will fetch another 16 bits. And it just does that over and over and over again. That's the whole life of this processor. And the whole trick is putting into memory the correct patterns of ones and zeros so that as the processor does this, it's doing something useful for us. 
It's driving a car down the hallway and turning left. Or it's reading a switch and, and driving a motor. All right, so if you look at table 20-1, let me go ahead and put this up. This is a table of everything that this chip knows how to do. And it's relatively short, it's two pages. And they're not even full pages. So what have we got? Well, it can do addition. That's a good thing. But it can't add numbers that are very big. Okay, this is technically an 8-bit processor. So its numbers are 8 bits. That's it. So we can't store the number 500 in a memory location. We can store numbers from 0 to 255. Or if we do two's complement from negative 128 to 127. So we can add things together. We can do a logical AND operation. So we can compare bits, and if they're both 1, set the output to 1. We can clear things. Clearing means write a 0 into it. That's a separate instruction. We can complement run it through an inverter, right? So change every one to a zero, change every zero to a one. And we spend a lot of time doing these logic operations in software, right? Writing a program which says, take this bit, and if this is a one and this is a one, then set this other bit to a zero, right? That's a logical NAND. We'll spend a lot of time doing things like that. Don't worry about these, but we can do comparison between things. We can decrement, which means subtract one. We can increment, which means add one. We can do ORs as well as ANDs. We can move things from one location to another. So there's a few different versions of moves. We can do a multiply, but again, it's only an 8-bit number. And it's an integer. Well, we can multiply. We can negate, which means take a 2's complement. We can do rotates, which means take your number as a series of bits and shift everything one way or another one position so we can move things side to side. More subtractions, uh, swap the two halves of an 8-bit number. We can do a few things with individual bits. So we can say here's an 8-bit number, take the third bit and set that to a zero. Branches are used to tell the CPU which instruction it should execute next. So remember, we have our memory, we have instructions stored in here, and the CPU goes out to memory, grabs an instruction, does what it says to do, and then it goes and grabs a new instruction. Where does it grab that instruction from? Normally, it starts at zero, and it just grabs the next instruction each time. But we can tell it with what's called a branch to say, hey, the next instruction you grab, instead of being from here, grab it from over here. Right? We can change where it starts pulling these instructions from. That's called a branch, and that's how we're going to basically implement looping and such. Um, it can do nothing, a no-op, which is actually really useful. Um, it can do something like a call and a return, like we do in C when you call a function and you return from it. Um, and that's pretty much it. Not a whole lot of capabilities, but it's enough. It's enough that if we had enough program memory in here, we could get this to do anything that I can get my laptop to do. Right? I just have to hook it up to a display and a keyboard, and I need a lot more than 4,000 bytes of memory. But functionally, it's as complete a set of instructions as what's inside my laptop. And it's actually more complete than probably what's inside your cell phone. They're more complex. All right. Let's take a five minute break. And then I want to start looking at the first lab and take you through the process of how we actually write a program and load it into this chip. 
and then we'll go from there.